Hello and good day everyone. My name is Darlena Birch, MBA, RDN, and most importantly, public health dietitian. Welcome to my YouTube channel where I discuss U.S. federal nutrition programs, the important role they play in ensuring the health and well-being of all Americans, and how public health dietitians work tirelessly to support these amazing programs. All views expressed on this channel are my own and do not represent the opinions of any entity whatsoever with which I have been, am now, or will be affiliated. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The DGAs provide a standard by which WIC and many other communities measure nutrition adequacy within populations. When the WIC food package undergoes scientific review, the nutritional adequacy of the WIC population is actually compared to the DGAs. Pregnancy and early childhood offer a unique window of opportunity to build healthier and more prosperous futures. Additionally, the foods that are provided in WIC help build a stronger nation and good nutrition during pregnancy and the first few years of a child's life provides the essential building blocks for brain development, healthy growth, and a strong immune system. And so the reason why I brought those two points up is because I want to highlight how the Dietary Guidelines for Americans play a vital role within the WIC program and also influence federal nutrition policy. Now that I've highlighted the important role that the DGAs play within the WIC program, I want to go into the history of the DGAs and talk about how they first came about. The federal government has actually provided dietary advice for the public for more than 100 years through bulletins, posters, brochures, books, and more recently, websites and social media. Dietary guidance has generally included advice about what to eat and drink for better health, but the specific messaging has changed throughout the years to reflect advances in nutrition science and the role of specific foods and nutrients on health. The earliest focus of dietary guidance was on food groups in a healthy diet, food safety, food storage, and ensuring that people get enough minerals and vitamins to prevent certain diseases that occur when a vitamin or mineral is lacking in the diet. As nutrition science has evolved, there was greater recognition of how the diet can play a role in disease prevention and health promotion. In 1980, the first publication of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans was released, and since then, the Dietary Guidelines have become the cornerstone of federal food and nutrition guidance. Now, a turning point for nutrition guidance in the U.S. began in the 1970s with the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. This committee came into existence as a bridge between interests in the Senate Agriculture Committee and the Labor and Public Welfare Committee. In its early years, the Senate Committee focused on programs designed to eliminate hunger, but more evidence linking diet to the nation's killer diseases was building and allowed the Senate Committee to expand its focus and investigate how nutrition related to the overall health of Americans. The Senate Committee indicated that healthy diets could play an important role in promoting health, increasing productivity, and reducing healthcare costs. The American diet has changed within the last 50 years and people needed guidance to improve their health through better nutrition. And the government has a role to provide nutrition guidance to Americans and to encourage the advancement of nutrition research and industry food reformulation. In 1977, after years of discussion, scientific review, and debate, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, led by Senator George McGovern, released dietary goals for the United States. The dietary goals recommended to avoid overweight, consume only as much energy as is expended. If overweight, decrease energy intake and increase energy expenditure. Increase the consumption of complex carbohydrates and naturally occurring sugars from about 28% of intake to about 48% of energy intake. Reduce the consumption of refined and processed sugars by about 45% to account for about 10% of total energy intake. Reduce cholesterol consumption to about 300 milligrams a day and limit the intake of sodium by reducing the intake of salt to about five grams per day. Changes in food selection and preparation to help individuals with achieving the dietary goals were also suggested. Following the release of the dietary goals, some groups and individuals expressed doubt that the science available at the time supported the specificity of the recommendations. And I do just want to pause a bit and take some time to humor over the fact that this was back in 1977 that there was this level of skepticism regarding the dietary goals. And if anyone has ever been involved in any process regarding the updating of the dietary guidelines for Americans, not much seems to have changed as there seems to be the same level of skepticism regarding Regarding the science upon which the DGAs are based. Um, I think it's great that we allow the public to raise our skepticism and I think that's one of the greatest things about our government is that we do have the capacity to voice our opinions regardless of how varying they are from one another but at the same time I just think it's so ultimately funny that we still struggle to reach a consensus regarding the dietary guidelines that the government issues. Now back to 1977. To support the credibility of the science used by the Senate Committee, 
the United States Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services, which was then known as the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, selected scientists from the two departments and obtained additional expertise from the scientific community throughout the country to address the public's need for authoritative and consistent guidance on diet and health. In February 1980, USDA and HHS collaboratively issued Nutrition and Your Health Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which described seven principles for a healthful diet to help healthy people in making daily food choices. The addition was based in part on the 1979 Surgeon General's Report on Health Promotion and Disease Prevention and the findings from a task force convened by the American Society for Clinical Nutrition, which reviewed the evidence relating six dietary factors to the nation's health. The focus on the 1980 Dietary Guidelines was to offer ideas for incorporating a variety of foods in the diet to provide essential nutrients while maintaining recommended body weight. It also provided guidance on limiting dietary components such as sugar, fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium, which were beginning to be seen as risk factors in certain chronic diseases. Both the Dietary Goals and the first Dietary Guidelines for Americans were different from previous dietary guidance in that they reflected evolving scientific evidence and changed the historical focus on nutrient adequacy to also identify the impacts of diet on chronic disease. These guidance documents discuss the concepts of moderation, including alcohol consumption, as well as nutrient adequacy. So now that I've gone over the history of the dietary guidelines, now I want to talk specifically about what the dietary guidelines actually are. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans provide advice on what to eat and drink and to meet nutrient needs, promote health, and prevent disease. It is developed and written for a professional audience including policymakers, healthcare providers, nutrition educators, and federal nutrition program operators. USDA and HHS work together to update and release the Dietary Guidelines for Americans every five years, and each edition of the Dietary Guidelines reflects the current body of nutrition science. What people eat and drink have an impact on their health. In the U.S., more than half of all adults have one or more preventable chronic diseases, many of which are related to poor diets and not enough physical activity. Given the high rates of chronic disease among Americans, the science that informs the dietary guidelines is examined through the lens of health promotion and disease prevention. This means that priority has been placed on studies that examine the relationship between diet and health across all life stages in men, women, and children from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds who are healthy or at risk of chronic disease. This scientific underpinning makes the dietary guidelines relevant to all Americans an important tool for health professionals, policymakers, and many other professionals. All Americans, no matter their health status, can benefit from making changes to what they eat and drink to build a healthy diet. The dietary guidelines are used by professionals to form the basis of federal nutrition policy and programs, including the WIC program, support nutrition education efforts, guide local, state, and national health promotion and disease prevention initiatives, and inform various organizations and industries. So who's involved in the DGAs? As I stated earlier, the DGAs were first released in 1980 and they are mandated to be released every five years under the 1990 National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act. The law requires that the dietary guidelines be based on the current body of nutrition science. USDA and HHS have evolved the process to update the dietary guidelines over time in step with developments in nutrition science, public health, and best practices in scientific review and guidance development. So one group that's involved in the creation of the Dietary Guidelines is the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, also known as the DGAC. The departments use an external federal advisory committee to review the current body of nutrition science. The DGAC includes nationally recognized scientific experts in nutrition and medicine. The product of the committee's work is a scientific report that is provided to the Secretaries of Agriculture and Health and Human Services. This committee is actually asked to look at nutrition science collectively to inform this report rather than using individual scientific studies or personal testimonies. The committee uses tools such as systemic reviews, data analysis, and food pattern modeling to carry out its work. Systemic reviews include a rigorous process that allows the committee to search, evaluate, and synthesize the body of nutrition research on a specific topic. Data analysis is used to evaluate the health of Americans and their diets, and food pattern modeling examines how changes to the amounts or types of foods and beverages in a dietary pattern might affect meeting nutrient needs. To promote transparency, the committee discusses all of its work in public meetings and supporting materials are provided to the public through the dietaryguidelines.gov website. Another group that's involved in the development of the dietary guidelines is the public, people like you and me. The public is encouraged to provide input at various times throughout the process. Before a 
the committee is established, the public is invited to provide comments on the topics and scientific questions to be examined by the DGAC. The public can also nominate people to the USDA and HHS committee membership. During the period of time the committee is reviewing the evidence, the public is invited to submit written comments and to provide oral testimony to the committee. Additionally, after the committee scientific report is submitted to the departments, for a period of time the public can give written comments as well as oral comments on the report at the public meeting. Now another group that's involved in the development of the dietary guidelines for Americans is obviously the federal government. As I've stated multiple times, USDA and HHS are responsible for updating and releasing the dietary guidelines. This includes oversight of the DGAC to ensure compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act providing opportunities for public input and developing the next edition of the Dietary Guidelines. Developing the Dietary Guidelines involves a step-by-step -step process of writing, review, and revision supported by a writing team of federal staff from USDA and HHS. The draft Dietary Guidelines goes through several rounds of review and revisions by peer reviewers outside of the federal government and all agencies with nutrition policies and programs across USDA and HHS, such as NIH, the National Institutes of Health, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, FNS, the Food and Nutrition Service, and FSIS, the Food Safety and Inspection Service. The final step of this process is departmental clearance, which ends with the review and sign-off of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans by the Secretaries of USDA and HHS. Once released, the new edition of the Dietary Guidelines replaces the previous edition. The release of the new edition is communicated to nutrition and health professionals within and outside of the federal government for broad implementation. So I'm going to wrap up today's video by talking specifically to the 2020 through 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The 2020 through 2025 DGAs were published in December 2020 and were the first to provide recommendations for pregnancy and birth through 24 months of age. This is especially important for WIC given that these populations are eligible to participate in the WIC program. Recommendations that were years in the making, I want to now just go into a little bit more detail about the kind of work that I did on behalf of my organization to represent the larger WIC community throughout the DGA development process. My work kicked off with leading the authoring and submission of a comment to USDA and HHS in the spring of 2018 regarding the DGA topics list and questions. I worked on that with a fellow dietitian colleague in the office and we collaborated with partner organizations to ultimately write a 30-page comment. It was quite an arduous process, but we got it done and we submitted the comment on time, and so we were able to represent the WIC community in this comment process. In the fall of 2018, I submitted a nomination to the DGAC on behalf of my organization. Unfortunately, our nominee was not selected, but the final DGAC did include a number of public health advocates. In the summer of 2019, I provided an oral comment to the DGAC on behalf of my organization. And throughout 2019 and 2020, I attended all five DGAC public meetings, either in person or virtually. In June of 2020, I led the authoring and submission of a written comment to the DGAC, which provided the WIC perspective, and this comment was framed by a section of my organization's board. I also virtually attended the DGAC's draft report meeting. Remember how I said that the DGAC does release a scientific report, so I attended the meeting where they released the draft report. In August 2020, I presented an oral comment on behalf of my organization in response to the DGAC's final report titled The Scientific Report of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. I also submitted a written comment on behalf of my organization in response to the scientific report, and I drafted a model comment that was made available to my organization's membership so that our members could provide a comment on behalf of their organizations. And of course, in December of 2020, the final 2020 through 2025 DGAs were released to the public. My organization issued a press release informing the WIC community of this. So that's my episode on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what you see, please smash the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And remember, you are your own best advocate. Feed your body well, nourish your soul, nurture your mind, and nutrify your spirit. Remain true to yourself and never forget that every second forward is another opportunity to be a better version of your past self.